started? Okay. Um, so let's see. Last time we had basically found that the the S the S operator was the time order product of e to the minus i, an integral with interaction in the interaction picture and um, taking the limits to infinity, this is the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity. And this gives the matrix element, the same matrix elements as, as U, the time evolution operator, which would be U to minus I, um, basically, 2t h, where uh, as t goes to infinity. These would give the same matrix elements between eigenstates of the free Hamiltonian. And so this is what we use, and what we do is we expand this so that it looks like 1 minus i over h bar integral of uh, vi of t dt, and vi of t differs from v of t by e to the, and now I forget the sign, damn it. Um, and, uh, I'm go way back in these notes to get the sign. Down here. e to the minus i h0 t in the wage bar. E to the i to the, the i h zero t over h one. Okay, so that's that's a review of what we did uh, last time. Now, this time, I want to um, talk about quantum field theory and um, quantizing the electromagnetic field and. Um, looking at the interaction between the electromagnetic field and um, an atom. And uh, so that would be the, that's basically the topic here. Um, one of the difficulties is converting uh, my old notes, which were in unrationalized heavy side Lorentz units to SI units. And, um, if you look at the online notes, you see that I only got through about seven pages of that. Um, let me first of all say what it is that's going on. You see, in other words, what's the idea behind quantizing the field? Um, basically, you have um, you have a quantum system with many Q's, Q sub I's, uh, then you find your P sub I's and you you say that QI commutator PJ is delta IJ and of course this comes from basically a Lagrangian and you say PJ is partial of the Lagrangian with respect to Q, J, dot. So that's the system that you set up. And um, in the case of, okay, so you can imagine instead of having just three Qs and three Ps for an ordinary particle in three dimensional space, you can imagine having a <coughs> field operator um, phi, in other words, qi, is going to be some field operator at a point xi at a time t. That would be qi of t. And um, so you imagine for each point of space you have a 
field operator. And um, that gives you your Q. And then the, depending on what your Lagrangian is, a typical Lagrangian for Lagrange density for a scalar field is um, a half phi dot squared um, minus a half grad phi squared minus a half mu squared phi squared. This is a Lagrange density for a free field. And you then would say that your conjugate momentum, so Pj of t, would be the partial of the Lagrange density with respect to phi i dot, and it would be phi, uh, phi i dot at xj and t, say. And this then would give you um, phi dot at xj and t. So these would be your two uh, canonically conjugate variables. And then what you want to do is say, is imitate this. So you want to say that phi at xi times t and phi dot at xj times t as a commutator that's i h bar. And now delta ij becomes delta q of xi minus xj. So that's basically the way you quantize the scale of field. Um, this thing is typically called pi of x, j, and t. And uh, so you could instead have in here pi of x, j, and t. And then you construct the Hamiltonian in the usual way. The Hamiltonian then is an integral dt x of a half pi squared squared t squared over t plus u squared over t t squared, this thing being an integral dq x pi dot pi minus the Lagrange density. And if you use this identification, then, uh, then you see you get this expression here. Um, so that's the basic way in which one does the quantization, and in order to have things work out like this, you basically say that your field x of t, you can do it as a sum over modes, modes k, and um, you then have some uh, a k. Uh, let's see, you might need to motivate this further. Well, let me just say that your, your field equation would come from the Lagrange density, and you'd say that the partial um, mu of partial L, partial phi, um, comma mu, uh, is equal to partial L partial P. And in that case, these, these derivatives here, this thing looks like minus D mu P, D mu P with a one half apart from the, the mass term. And um, so what you find is an equation that's d mu d mu phi um, is equal to mu squared phi. And um, uh, I need a minus sign there. So that's your equation of motion. And so if you expand these things, as uh, a sub k times some both uh, a, a, let us say, you can expand them in Fourier space, a k dot x, but now this a k is an a sub k of t plus a k dagger of t, you know, minus r k dot x. And, um, 
then because of this equation, you see that the field operator, if you apply this to, if you substitute this expression for the field into here, what you get is minus d mu d mu on the d then is a sum over k. The, this would be a double dot of k minus k vector squared a of k times c d i k dot x and then plus the complex conjugate term. So that would be the expression and you want this to equal mu squared let me see if I have the signs right. I kind of got that sign wrong. You want this to be mu squared d and so that would mean we have I'll get this one right in a second. Well, it would be mu squared times a k and yeah, there's just an overall sign that's wrong. Yeah. Well, I guess I shouldn't try to do this without going slowly step by step. Yeah, this would be a plus. If that's a plus, then there's a minus here and a minus there. So it looks like this. And so that tells you then that a minus a k double dot is equal to k squared plus mu squared times a to the k. And this is what you want because then you can say that the a to the k is e to the minus i omega k t and that will give you the equation omega k squared is equal to k squared plus mu squared. And so that's our expression then for the energy. I'm unfortunately in doing this for some reason I decided it would be pedagogically useful to do this without my departing from my notes and so I've got h bars loose all over the place. Actually k dot x is okay. I don't need an h bar there. In any event, one finds that a has this time dependence and so that's basically how you work out a scalar field. Alright, so now we're going to apply this sort of approach to electrodynamics which is more complicated. We start out with Maxwell's equations and SI units. There are two homogeneous equations. And two inhomogeneous equations. Curve of D is mu zero K plus E dot over C squared. And we introduce scalar and vector potentials. So E is minus rad T minus A dot and B occurs as curve of A. 
these two equations actually then imply these two equations. They imply the homogeneous equations. Um, in particular, the divergence of the curl is zero, and um, uh, if you take the curl of this expression and you get curl of E, then you get a B dot on the other side, and the curl of the gradient is zero. So this equation gives that one. Um, these scalar and vector potentials form a four vector. The four vector is a, uh, I use the Greek letter, a mu is the scalar potential over C, and then the vector potential. Now, a gauge transformation is a change. A mu of a, a mu prime of x is the old a mu of x plus d mu lambda of x, where lambda is any scalar function of space and time, so any scalar field. And um, under a gauge transformation, so under uh, e times e, e, e times e. So e and e don't change. So that's basically maximal equation. Now what we do is we go to the Coulomb gauge, also known as the radiation gauge, L dot A equals zero. And just for completeness, let's use the gauge transformation to get there. We want zero is del dot A prime. So that will be del dot A plus gradient lambda and, uh, so, sorry, uh, plus divergence of gradient lambda. And we want that to be zero, and so what we say is that um, del squared lambda should be minus the divergence of the old end. And uh, so if we choose lambda as the solution of this differential equation, make gauge transformation the new equation, the new gauge field will be in, uh, in um, the radiation gauge or the Coulomb gauge. Now, Gauss's law, which is over here, um, tells us that del dot E, and now in the, see the nice thing about the radiation gauge is that the divergence of E doesn't involve A dot, because A has no divergence, so this is just equal to minus Grad squared phi, or Laplacian of phi, which is rho over epsilon zero. And then you can solve for that. And when you solve for that, you get phi of x and t equals one over four pi epsilon zero, an integral d cubed y, the charge density rho at y and t divided by the distance between the point of observation and the point of the charge density, well, which is all space. So that's phi. And um, this is something important has just happened, uh, that which happens in this Coulomb gauge, which is one of the reasons why it's a very physical gauge and a nice gauge to work in. And it's that this phi, which this phi has just become a dependent field, a dependent variable. It depends on the charge density. And so it's basically gone from the, there's no issue of quantizing phi because phi is whatever rho is. And if we've got rho quantized, then that's what phi is. And if we 
If we were to do this in full detail and start with Lord Rondon and then construct the Hamiltonian in a canonical way, we would see at some point that um, we get a part of the Hamiltonian, the charged part of the Hamiltonian, would be an integral of um, rho of x rho of y dq x dq y over rho pi epsilon zero x minus y and then an extra factor of one half because we're counting the charges twice. Um, so this would appear in the Hamiltonian and in fact we'll see it show up later when we talk about the atom. Uh, now, of course, the reason why this is a solution of this equation is that minus, let me just say that this thing is this grad, grad school. This is the divergence of grad, and this is often written as Laplacian. Minus Laplacian with respect to x of 1 over x minus y is equal to 4 pi delta Q of x minus y. So this into here gives us that, as you certainly know.
far from the point X. So in other words, this feed is given by digital flow into all states at the same time. So charges in Andromeda count because they're weighted by 1 over the distance. So they don't count much, and Andromeda is basically neutral, so it doesn't have any effect. But that's an awkward thing about this. It doesn't mean the theory violates relativity. It just means that the gauge choice, the gauge choice, del dot A equals 0, isn't a relativistically covariant choice of gauge. Okay, well, we don't need to. We don't need to knock ourselves out over that. Let me get back to these basic solutions. Here we have this wave equation. What's the simple solution of it? Well, A of X and T can be just some A0, E to the I, K dot X minus omega T. And then, because then A double dot is equal to minus omega squared A, and Laplacian on A is equal to minus K squared A. And so the whole equation is minus K squared plus omega squared over C squared times A is equal to 0. And that just tells us that omega is equal to KC, where K is the length of the vector. So that's our relation. Now, there's one more thing. We have this Coulomb gauge condition. So what does that tell us about this vector A here? Well, if del dot A is to vanish, del dot A, of course, involves I, K dot A0 times this exponential. So that means that K dot A0 equals 0 in the Coulomb gauge. So A0 must be a vector perpendicular to K. All right, so now we're going to do box quantization. We're going to do volume L cubed. So the box of side L, and we want A of 0. Well, there's no arrow on this. This is actually the number 0. X, Y, Z, T to equal A of L, Y, Z, T. And so forth for the other, the X, Y, X, for the Y and the Z directions. And what that means, then, is that A of X vector in T is some polarization vector divided by the square root of volume times the E to the I, K dot X minus omega T, where K, the vector, is 2 pi over L times the vector of integers N1, N2, N3. And notice here that epsilon sub R of K dot K equals 0. So the polarization vectors have to be perpendicular to the three momentum. And these integers N sub I are plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, et cetera. Of course, they vary independently. Okay, is there any question about this? Now, in three-dimensional space, you have three orthonormal vectors. So one is K, the other two are 
epsilon 1, epsilon 2, so R goes from 1 to 2. And we might as well make them normalized, so ER of K dot ES of K is equal to delta RS, and K dot ER of K equals to 0. So that, that's those are the polarization values. Now, if you, if you take them to be real, and you can, you can basically, most calculations assume that they're real, makes things a little bit simpler. Um, the real ones represent linearly polarized fields. In general, though, they're polarized. Okay, so what is our um, what is our field? Doing this field quantization, then. We have the sum over these different modes. Sum over all the k's, k's being these things, these vectors. Then we have a, what we call the fudge factor, which is a normalization factor, which is 2 epsilon 0 v omega k. And all of that to the one half. I left out the one half in the online notes for some reason. And then what we've got is epsilon sub r, the vector of k, k sub r, and k, and for some reason I put t back in here, but it seems to me this is kind of gilding the lily, but all right, I'll put the t back in for the moment. E v i k dot x plus E sub r star of k and dagger sub r of k and C e minus i k dot x. Okay, so that's the expression. But once again, we want it to satisfy the wave equation, which um, here is Laplacian minus the second time derivative over c squared or 0 equals the Laplacian n minus the double value of the c squared. And that gives you that the uh, double dots of R of K and C is just um, minus KC squared A sub R A C. E minus I omega K C A star. Well, which A star K, simply so in other words, A sub R K and C is E minus I omega T times that. We take that for the A. And um, so, in other words, I spoke the way to do this is to edit with a eraser e to the i k dot x minus omega t, and then over here. That's our expression for the electromagnetic field. And um, I'm going to use that bit of T. Now, if you're seeing this for the first time, there should be some questions. Um, Here when, we were, when I was talking about quantization in the very beginning, 
I said that what you want to do is you want to have phi with phi dot be something like a delta function. Okay. The way you get that in this particular case is a little more tricky in the case of the electromagnetic field because first of all it's in cool gauge and secondly it's a vector field. Um, what we will do is to impose these quantization conditions a sub r of k my goodness, I left out a dagger a dagger sub r prime of k prime is delta sub k k prime delta r r prime. Remember we're in uh, we're, we're in a box, we quantize in a box so this is a discrete set of modes. This, these are then the commutation relations. A with itself a sub r a r prime prime is zero and that implies of course a r dagger a r prime dagger. So this is the key quantization relation. What this means is that the if I remember correctly it means that basically your your a i it turns out that the conjugate momentum to a is again essentially a dot which is e and you've got something like um, uh, let me just call it pi j which is related to e is going to be i h bar but now it can't be delta ij because these components aren't really independent because they have to satisfy the Coulomb gauge condition. So it turns out this is a transverse delta function. It's got to be transverse in the sense that, um, and in fact, is I should put an ij on it. It's a transverse delta function because it has to satisfy del dot. This transverse delta function has to be zero. Anyway, leave, leave that aside. Uh, those are some technicalities that uh, come up in the case of the electromagnetic field, which of course is the real case. And um, that's one of the somewhat embarrassing things about quantum field theory. The, the machinery goes through without any squeaks or bumps for the case of a scale field. But as soon as you leave the simple case of a scale field and try to quantize a field, the, there are theoretical subtleties that show up. There's been one half, there's been one, and so forth. And um, There one sign, I think, that quantum field theory isn't the last word. There's something beyond it that we don't, we don't know about. Whether it's string theory, I don't know, but there's got to be something better than quantum field theory. All right, anyway, but on the other hand, in quantum electrodynamics is extremely accurate, as, as you know. So let's, uh, let's appreciate it. Okay, well, if you remember back weeks ago, before we started perturbation theory, I discussed um, the charged particle and electromagnetic field and the Hamiltonian uh, associated with that and so forth. So let's go back to that for a minute. What we have there is the Hamiltonian is 1 over 2m T minus QA of X and T squared plus Q phi of X and T. I'm leaving out spin for a moment. It turns out electron spin doesn't have a lot to do with really some simple calculations. If you want to add in spin, you can say minus Q over M S dot B of X and T where uh, X is equal to sigma. So that's, that's uh, 
in this this Q fee this term here is actually the term that I said arises from oh my goodness I skipped something uh, something important um, remember I said that this gives rise to this thing here well this thing here um, is effectively phi rho integrated um, and that gives rise in the case of in which the, the part of the, the charge density of the particle is just Q times delta Y minus X that just gives you Q times the, the scale potential at X and T so this term came from that term there. What I skipped by mistake was the Hamiltonian for the field. So this is sort of the matter Hamiltonian. The field Hamiltonian, the part of it apart from the part involving phi, is an integral e cubed x epsilon 0 over 2 e squared of x and two, plus 1 over 2 mu 0 B squared of that So that's the Hamiltonian for what we can call the transverse part, because here E is minus A dot now. Remember the part for, for phi we've separated out and it's turned into the charge, the charge charge, the charge charge over the distance term. And B, the B is always curled. Notice, because of the unfortunate um, notation in standard units, we have epsilon zero in the numerator here, and we have mu zero in the denominator here. And one of the uh, amazing things about epsilon zero and mu zero is that the product is one of the C squared. All right. This Q phi is uh, for the case of uh, an electron around a proton, it's minus Q squared over 4 pi epsilon 0 x, and um, that's minus C squared over x, which you can also write as minus alpha h bar C over x, where um, alpha is e squared over h bar c, which is 1 over 137.04. Okay, so, um, or, or, uh, this really is appropriate to have questions. Um, Are there any questions about this? Any mistakes you want to correct? All right. Okay, so what are the interaction terms? By the way, this P minus QA is really the mechanical momentum. Um, so what's the interaction? Now I notice something that's really um, amusing and it might be puzzling if you see it for the first time. So let me just point it out to you. See, P is canonically conjugate to X. Here's X. X is in the argument of the electromagnetic field. As well as in the argument of this. So let's say... Um, it's, um, it's an interesting uh, expression. What is our interaction? So let me just point out what the three terms are. The, of course, this part, the P squared over 2m and the Q phi is what, uh, let's in fact specialize to the case of photons interacting with a hydrogen atom so we know what we're doing. 
once we get beyond the hydrogen atom, the quantum mechanics becomes too difficult for us to do exactly. It's terribly embarrassing. But anyway, P squared over 2N minus E squared over R, that's the hydrogen atom. We know those solutions we worked them out earlier in the year, if somewhat rapidly. So that's the, so the free Hamiltonian for us is going to be the Hamiltonian for the transverse fields, which is quadratic in the annihilation and creation operators, and the P squared over 2M minus E squared over X. That will be, that will be that. In fact, let me, I, I, unfortunately, I don't know why I'm so sticky today. One, your homework problem, the extra homework problem would be to show that if you substitute this expression into here, you find that the Hamiltonian for the fields is sum over K, sum over R equals 1 to 2, H bar omega K, H sub R dagger of K, H sub R of K, plus a half. So that will be the homework problem. Now, the extra homework problem I'm going to assign you to follow. Now, notice this one half here. This one half, when summed over all of these, gives you a terribly divergent number. And that's one of the really embarrassing things about quantum field theory. And it's one of the reasons why we think maybe the supersymmetry is right. Because in supersymmetry, you're able to cancel this one half against the minus one half that occurs when you quantize a spin one half field, or an amplitude field. The extra term is a minus one half. So the worst part cancels. Okay. So in other words, our H0, our big H0, is an H0 matter. It's P squared over 2M minus E squared over R. H0 field, well, is just, maybe I'll put a zero on this. H0 field is what I just wrote there. And so what's the interaction? Well, the interaction that's left is just the two terms that come from here, plus this if we put in spin, and usually we're not going to. So the interaction is minus Q over M, A of X and T dot P, and then the quadratic term, P squared over 2M, A vector of X and T squared. And this M, this M should really be the reduced mass, but I'm not going to emphasize that, so it's really the reduced mass. Now let me point out something that's another reason why people love the Coulomb gauge, and it's that, you see, I just wrote this once. I didn't write a P dot A term, whereas when you square this thing, you get P dot A plus A dot P. Why didn't I write them? The reason is that the divergence of A is zero, and so if you have P dot A minus A dot P, that's H bar over I divergence of A, which is zero. So that's the great advantage of the Coulomb gauge. Remember, P is H bar over I. Are we all happy? So this is a nice feature of the Coulomb gauge. That means that you can just write this as one term. All right, well, we're now going to get a sip of tea, and then we're ready to actually consider the absorption of a photon by an atom.
Let's see. I I guess I, I skipped a little bit here in the algebra. I introduced these creation and annihilation operators. Um, let me just say what they do. The ground state of the of H zero F is just the vacuum, and A sub R of K annihilates the vacuum for all K. Then the creation operator, AR dagger of K on the vacuum turns us into one state, a state of uh, that has one photon of momentum K and polarization R, polarization index R. If we then have a dagger of, oops, a sub r prime, k prime acting on the state kr, then we get a state that is as k prime r prime and also kr. So this is a state of two photons. And one can think of this as, um, of course, they have to be synchronized. So you can think of it as 1 over root 2, you know, um, k prime, let me suppress the polarization, k prime k plus k k prime k prime. And so forth. As you add more creation operators, you get um, uh, more particles. But in quantum field theory, we don't write down, we, we don't do this explicitly. In other words, we don't say, we, we just write it this way, that there's a, it's a state containing a photon with momentum K and polarization R, and another photon of momentum K prime and polarization R prime. Um, um, Now, and in fact, if you go to the continuum limit, in other words, we're not quantizing inside some cavity, say, in a laser, but instead we're out in empty space, then the possibility that K and K prime would ever be exactly the same is Zippo, and it's going to be completely ignored. Um, but if we're talking, if we do let these K and K prime be the same, then you can see that a dagger, and let me suppress polarization again, a dagger of k on the state k would be, if you let k equal to k prime, these two states are the same. And so you have square root of 2 times 2k. In other words, the creation operator pulls out the square root of k. And in fact, I could do it also for the case of Three. Let me get my notes so it is confusing. Um, I couldn't find this in any book and had to work it out. Must be in some. Must be. Fox, by the way, is um, the person who worked out much of this. Uh, this is this is called the Fox things. At least he did it for scale field. I suppose he. Probably did it the ordinary. Anyway, um, suppose we've got um, a dagger k double prime on a state k k prime. Then this is going to give us a state k k prime k double prime. Although some people like to say that if you started with k and then k prime, it really should be this one. I think that's the way Weinberg writes. In any event, um, because it doesn't make any difference. Um, so that's what the creation operator does. But now, what happens if we're, we're if k k prime and k double prime are all the same? Then we have a dagger of k on this state, but this state now is square root of 2, 2k, 
equals this state, which is 1 over square root of 6, then there's 6 identical terms. So there's a 6 here. So this is square root of 6. Well, this is in parentheses here. Times 3K. So that tells us that A value of K on the state 2K is equal to square root of 3 to the state 3K. And these are the harmonic oscillators. So in other words, for a single mode, what you have is A data on the state of N photons is square root of N plus 1, N plus 1, for the particular mode. And similarly, A, if you work this backwards, you have, oh, I didn't say what A did over here. Well, A annihilates that, but A also, because of the commutation relations that we have there, A takes, say, KR back into the vacuum state. And moreover, for a given mode, A on N is square root of N, N minus 1. Okay? So we're all square root of N. In any event, the easiest, what, as far as I know, everybody does is when you bring in the creation annihilation operators, you then forget about how you did things in, with identical particles and quantum mechanics, and everything becomes subsumed into these commutation relations. And with these commutation relations, you never have to, you never again have to think about these things. It may be a loss that you don't have to think, but there's enough things to think about. And the creation annihilation operators just make everything automatic. Okay, let me get a drink. Thank you. 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 Thank you
one thing that just occurred to me that I would normally suppress, but just to be perfectly honest, A has X's here, and when you subject A to the whole Hamiltonian, including this part, which has a P-squared in it, that P-squared would act on these things, and I don't know, it may be saved by the criminal engagement condition, but I don't see it. I don't remember ever seeing that discussed in any treatment of this I've seen, so I'm going to ignore that for the moment. So what is B in the interaction picture? Well, it's going to be minus Q over M. A is already in the interaction picture because of this P dependence, the E to the I omega T on the creation and annihilation operators, but we need E to the I H0 matter T over H bar P, E to the minus I H0 matter T over H bar. So this is the V in the interaction picture that we're going to use. And this H0 involves P squared over R. And as I said, A is already in the interaction picture because it has that period of time dependence. Okay, so what is our time? Well, we're almost out. Let me just say that obviously what we're going to do is we're going to say that psi of T in our interaction picture here is the time order product of E to the minus I over H bar integral from, let us say, 0 to T, V I prime to T prime, acting on psi 0 interaction. I don't know if we really need that. And in particular, in this case that we're talking about, in other words, this interaction picture stuff is kind of overkill. So the initial state with N photons of type R, momentum K, this is going to be, at time T, this is going to be effectively 1 minus I over H bar integral 0 to T. This is the lowest order computation, T prime to T prime times I N sub R of K at time 0. So this is where we'll pick up next time. We'll work this out. Thank you.